We all want love, but most of us don't want to date to get it. Because let's be honest, dating kind of sucks. But maybe it doesn't have to if we actually know what we're doing. Hi, I'm Kira Sabin, and this is Reinventing Dating, a smart and sweary podcast for all singles to learn the mindsets and skills to date with intention and confidence. Join me weekly as I break down the science and psychology behind what's working in our dating culture and what isn't. Every week I bring a new topic, trend, skill, or mindset that can help us get out of our own way to learn how to date for relationships that we actually want. Because love isn't broken, but dating kind of is. But I'm reinventing it. Let's do this. Well, hello there, sugar pants, and welcome back to another episode of Reinventing Dating. I'm Kira. We are back for our fourth week, our fourth episode in our current series of common dating questions through a modern and healthy dating perspective or lens. A few things to keep in mind about this series. I'm going to be answering some of the very common questions that I get asked the most and that I see online, but bringing them here and talking about them through a more modern, non-gender role, healthy, science-backed, psychology-backed perspective. A few reminders. This is about finding a partner. So everything through my perspective is about partnerships, not just dating, not just relationships, not just getting a girlfriend or a boyfriend, but actual partner. I want people to be looking for partner behavior rather than just catching feelings. I'm back a day late again because I did so much research this week on this topic to bring you thoughtful, helpful ideas and concepts that will actually better your dating life. I think you're going to be pretty excited. But I first want to give a quick shout out to a couple of reviews that I got on the podcast. Now, I'm just going to tell you that I saw these reviews just randomly this morning. I went over to check something about the podcast on Apple Podcasts. I don't necessarily look at the published podcast all that often. But I had two new reviews in the last week. And honestly, I haven't had a review in like a year. And I just want to tell you guys, I wept. I didn't cry. There wasn't tears. There wasn't sniffling. I wept reading these. I'm out here every week talking out to the ether. I don't make money on these podcasts. So having people share, review, comment, fucking brilliant. So I just want to say... KHCJ5225. She wrote, Please listen, the only dating podcast that makes me feel better after listening. She addresses hard things with hope and a growth mindset to change our thoughts, behaviors, and our world for the better. When other podcasts just state the poor and they don't address what to do instead. I think she meant problem, but truly valuable information that will make everybody's relationships and lives much more meaningful, intentional, and joyful. Cure is a gift to the world. Thank you so much. And then the awesome and very delightful Belle wrote, So helpful. Cures refreshing and fabulous at giving clarity. There's so many articles and dating advice on Instagram quotables. And she excels at fine-tuning all of that and quieting the extra noise. She'll give you hope, humor, practical steps, and insight. And she's funny. Thank you so much. (laughs) Give it a listen with an open mind. Thank you. I just wanted both of you to say to both of you, this is the shit that keeps me going on the tough days. And lately there's been more tough days than good days. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. These are the small and tiny ways in online acts of kindness that I think we could all be doing for each other. And because somebody did that, I actually went and did that on a couple of my favorite podcasts this morning. I'm like, I need to be doing this more. I need to be walking the talk that I share. So I just went to a couple of podcasts that I thoroughly enjoy, that I learn from, or that I laugh with. I listen to mostly entertainment or true crime podcasts. And it was, it just felt good. It felt good. It gave me a warm and fuzzy feeling inside. And I like warm and fuzzy feelings, especially orgasms. Just ran that out there. Please know I say shit like that, mostly for my own entertainment. And I hope you guys think it's funny too. But let's get into today. Let's get into this topic. It's going to be, I'm not going to say that what I'm sharing today is going to be controversial. I just think the topic of chivalry is a dead, you know, what men should do or what women should do is a really, really tough topic right now because so many things have changed. 
so many things are evolving, including gender roles, gender stereotypes, things like that. So I will be talking a lot actually about gender today, not something I do very often, but due to the fact that chivalry has a lot to do with kind of men and how they act towards women. There will be some societal norms today. I'll be leaning into heteronormative relationships a lot, which just means the relationship of a man and a woman. And when I talk about gender, I want to just say this really quickly. I think it's absolutely fucking the most ridiculous thing that ever existed on this earth. And that's just dramatic because there's a lot of absolutely ridiculous things on this earth that we speak of men as one gender who do all the same things and think the same way and that there's maybe a couple of good ones and a lot of bad ones, but we are just talking about their gender as in everybody's the same. Like women are the same. We all need to lean into our feminine, divine bullshit and all of these different things. I'm not really here for that. I'm really here for you getting to know your date, your partner, your person on an intimate and personal level. And you're going to realize when you do that, that these societal norms don't make sense at all. Danny and I don't follow any societal norms. We follow what works for our relationship. And that's what I want for everybody. But today, I want to talk about this, this idea of chivalry. I want to talk about how things have changed. And I think a lot of us think not for the better. And I dis the fuck agree. (laughs) I disagree. I 100% disagree. And I'm going to tell you why. So today I'm going to be talking about what chivalry is, where it came from, a lot of concepts that we kind of think are chivalrous and where their origin is. Yeah, (laughs) I'm fucking bringing it today, my friends. I'm also going to talk about what's helping, what's not. And just like I'm reinventing dating over here, I'm reinventing chivalry. So I have 12 things at the end that I think are chivalrous things that we can be doing, kind of specifically all of us, not just men, that are actually going to get us into relationships we want, which is the whole fucking point. And I do want to say that if you really like this episode, I did an episode in the first season of this podcast about the history of love and dating and why it still matters. And it's a great kind of companion with this episode. It's it's kind of a, if you haven't listened to it and you thought, boring, it's not. And I don't even like fucking history and it's not. I think it's really important that as grown ass people in 2024, if we're going to take the time, the energy, the money, the mental and emotional exhaustion of dating, we might as well be knowing what we're doing and making sure that what we believe or the mindsets we have are actually working for us. So let's start with the very simple thing. I love to do definitions. And almost every kind of workshop that I do in my solo or group programs starts simply with, here's what this thing is. Because it's amazing when we talk about something, how many different opinions we have. And when we get clear on what something is and where it came from, we just all can get on the same page, which I think is always what we're trying to do here. So first of all, the word chivalry came around in the 11th and 12th centuries. That's right. And it was developed as a code of honor that emphasized bravery, loyalty, and generosity for knights at war. So it's not really about rescuing princesses or doing good deeds because here's the fucking deal. It turns out that knights or different people who were out conquering were not very nice. The words raping and pillaging came from this time. So these knights were not chivalrous. They weren't riding the white horse. They weren't doing any of these things. The first rules of chivalry had to do with not being total fucking assholes, conquering, burning shit down, plundering, pillaging, and that's right, raping people, women, 
maybe even children, around the world. So these came about to basically stop people from being horrible, horrible, horrible people. Just a reminder, there is a very large controversy that I weirdly went down the rabbit hole on. We think that red hair is an Irish or a Scottish thing, particularly Irish. Do you know how it got there? The fucking Vikings from Scandinavia because of them taking over the land so much and raping everyone. So just that. So chivalry was really established to keep these like thuggish medieval knights who would just go anywhere and do anything in check. Here were a couple of the original concepts for knights and chivalry. Thou shalt believe that all the church teaches and observe it in all directions. So right away, we're going back to religion and do what the church says without asking. Now, whatever you feel about religion, whatever, that's fine. I grew up Methodist. I identify more now as spiritual or Buddhist. But just the same, we can say that religion, particularly in the past, was not very helpful to the average person. Thou shalt defend the church. Thou shalt love the country in which th thou wast born. Thou shalt not recoil before thine enemy. Thou shalt make war against the infidel without sensation and without mercy. So there was a kindness attached to this. There was actually just rules of you follow us, you follow the church, you follow what your country wants of you, because they would sometimes go out and just take over a city or area that was actually still their people, but they were just violent hungry because this is what they've been doing their whole life and raised to do. And so they had to put these in place so that they could aim the person, the weapon, the destruction to their benefit. So I'm not going to go on here, but ultimately the kindest thing on any of these rules is thou shalt be everywhere and always the champion of the right and the good against injustice and evil. But who knows in the 11th and 12th century what they thought was injustice and evil? We don't know. And I feel like I'm really, really cool with maybe not holding on to or living <laughs> based on rules that were created in the 11th and 12th century to stop men from burning down villages and raping people. Just throwing that out there. Because there was a time where there was just massive civilian casualties, and it was just an effort to set ground rules for nightly behavior. That's it. Because they were heavily armed and prone to violence. That is a big thing. And where we started getting kind of this more knight in shining armor and idea that chivalry is a, a beautiful thing and taking care of the weak and the fragile and women and children was really just appearing in romance fiction centuries later. And they were written mostly for young no noblemen who were being trained for knighthood. And it was presented as pious, generous, and merciful. And, and here's a quote from some romantic fiction back then. To be a great knight, you ought to have consideration of civilians and for women. Okay. So consideration, guys. <laughs> That's it. That's the consideration. That's it. Not don't rape them, but just consideration for them. And the greatest knights are inspired by the love of some lady out there, and they want to impress her and win her love by doing great deeds. Now, this was actually never a rule for knights. This was just what poets at the time were writing about knights, basically early romance novels on some level. This was like the Fifty Shades of Armor of the 15th century. So let's move on. Now that I gave you guys like a little bit of a history of chivalry and knighthood and these knight in shining armor... That doesn't obviously apply to 2024 in any way. Let's talk about what we now think more is modern chivalry. And the definition I found online, because by the way, the normal definition of chivalry 
on like dictionary.com. They don't really have a good modern chivalry definition. It's still for knights in the past and past centuries. But I did find one that I think works in what we believe, which is chivalry for, refers to polite, kind, and unselfish behavior, especially by men towards women. True chivalry involves treating people as valuable individuals and wanting to know someone's thoughts or stories. Now, I would just like to point out, that's a low fucking bar that we're asking for basic, polite, kind, and unselfish behavior. That when we're talking about men towards women, or just in general, that it's polite, kind, and unselfish behavior. I think that we can all say that should be the basis for all of us. That's not chivalry. That should be something that we are all actively working on just to be decent humans in our world. I'm just going to throw that out there. And true chivalry involves treating people as valuable individuals and wanting to know someone's thoughts or stories. If that is our definition of chivalry, I mean, what the fuck? What the fuck? Like, come on. Come on. Is this what we're holding on to? This idea that maybe somebody is polite or kind or has unselfish behavior? And if you're honestly listening to this and going, well, every person I've dated wasn't polite, wasn't kind, and didn't have unselfish behavior, I do really think you take a step back and look at who you're choosing. Because for as many unhealed people out there, which is what I will call them, unhealed people, there are certainly people who are willing to try, who are willing to work on that. And if we find ourselves in the same type of situation with the same types of people again and again and again, we got to check ourselves. We're the common denominator there. So here are some of the examples that I found online of what people think modern chivalry includes. Opening or holding the door for someone, offering a seat to someone in need, offering to help and carry things, putting your partner's jacket on for them, like holding it for them to get into, uh, standing. That's a big kind of old school one, right? That men stand when a woman comes to the table or when they leave the table. Another thing that I think that was modern chivalry when I was growing up and what I believed dates should do is they pick us up, maybe they come to the door, they meet our parents, but they drop us off and maybe walk to the door. That's a modern chivalry. Just making sure that person gets home safely. Next, another modern chivalry. This was all over TikTok in 2022, by the way, the sidewalk rule. Maybe you've heard of it. Maybe you haven't. It's where men should be expected to be on the outside of the sidewalk so that if a car were to come and splash that he takes the splashing or I think everybody's fucked if you get hit by a car or that car swings because everybody's getting hurt in that scenario. But I'm going to talk about that in just a few minutes. And then paying for dates and paying for the wooing or the courting. And by the way, I am not discussing that this week. I'm discussing that next week because that is its own whole episode in itself. So I have, and this was a labor of love, my friend. I've looked up the history of many of these chivalrous acts that I just was talking about. And honestly, lots of them are not as chivalrous or kind as you think. I have referenced and I'm referencing a ton of different articles in this and you will find them all in the show notes if you guys want to do a deep dive into what I learned. I'm just bringing the main thoughts with a lot of swear words over here. But a few things to remember before I go into where the origin of this is, that women had no rights of their own, even to their own bodies and children. I first want to read to you guys from an article that honestly blew my fucking mind. And it's about something called coverture. I didn't know this existed. The woman, her name is Catherine Al Gore, wrote this article. And it starts off like this. And I just think it's a great little story to to bring us into this mindset and headspace. My mother-in-law loves the story, she says. A few years ago, my husband Andrew and I went to apply for a mortgage. 
as a candidate for a house mortgage, and this is the part my mother-in-law loves, I characterize myself as greater than my husband. I'm older. I have longer work history and more senior in our common profession. We're both professors. I make more money. I have a longer credit history than him, and I've actually owned more houses. And finally, she said, though this is a matter of dispute, I'm even a tiny bit taller. But the only qualification that mattered in this transaction was my status as wife. And when our broker filled out the application, she listed Andrew first as the borrower and me second as the co-borrower. Did I mention that my last name starts with A and his is with J? So it was not an alphabetical thing. And when I pointed this out, our broker, a woman of a certain age with long experience in her profession, sympathized but stated that if she had made me the primary borrower, the lawyers would fuss at her and just revert to the traditional categories. Honey, she told me, a what professor of women's history, because this woman is, it's a man's world. So that kind of starts this conversation of something called coverture, which I'm going to dive into here in just a moment, but how that it still affects us today, whether we notice it or not, whether we acknowledge it or not. And it's a long-standing legal practice that's part of our colonial heritage. And here is what she says that I think is just a pretty smart reminder if you knew this and maybe just information if you didn't. So coverage her since the American Revolution held that no female person had a legal identity. At birth as a female baby, she was covered by her father's identity. And then when she was married, by her husband's. Now, have you guys heard of the husband and wife become one, you know, or two halves of one whole? That actually is steeped in history. And it's because they did become one, but that one was the husband. And it was a symbol of subsuming of the identity. And women took the last name of their husbands because of this. Basically, we were saying, taking their name, I am now property of this person. Ultimately, women did not legally exist. Married women could not make contracts or be sued, so they could never own or work in business. Married women owned nothing, not even the clothes on their back. They had no rights to their children, so that if a wife divorced or left a husband, she would never see her children again. Married women had no rights to their bodies. That meant that would not only would a husband have a claim to any wages generated by his wife's labor or the fruits of her body, meaning her children, they're his, but he also had the absolute right to sexual access. And within marriage, a wife's consent was implied. So under the law, all sex-related activity, including rape, was legitimate. P.S., that didn't go away to being illegal until the 1980s. Yeah, 1980s. Not 1880s, 1980s which in my head is 20 years ago, but is actually like 40-ish. Within a marriage, a wife's consent was implied. His total mastery of this fellow human being stopped short, but just st short of death. So they were allowed to beat their wives as long as they didn't beat them to death. They were allowed to beat the children. It didn't matter because everything that a man did was legal and women had no rights. And as a reminder, I found this other great quote in another article. All of this will be in the show notes. If both lower and middle and upper class family marriages were more of a business deal than a relationship, love was not a factor in any marriage in the 17th century of England or America. A woman typically married in her early 20s, arranged marriages occurred primarily for reasons and resources such as money and land. It was expected that a man would beat his wife and not be seen as an issue. Children did not have close relationships with their parents or siblings either. There was a high infant mortality rate, and that was a common issue and the reason why many women had a high number of childbirths but a lower number of children. That's why so many people had kids in the olden days. And I'm not just telling you this for, ooh, you should look at it. You might be like, what does that have to do with me? But it all matters, so stay with me. And if you have ever done anything on Ancestry.com, if you've ever looked at your just ancestors, a lot of times you'll notice like six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven children. 
And typically, most mothers had up to eight children in hopes that some would survive and be able to work for the family. You are there to populate. You are there to have children and raise them. And high infant mortality rates were a major issue during this time. My grandfather, grandfather, not great grandfather, not great great grandfather, my grandfather, they had a child whose grave just says baby Schlamer. That's my mom's maiden name. Baby Schlamer, because he didn't live to be a year. They never even gave him a name because he was born sick. So that was in the early 1900s. Now, the mother of the household would often have many children because not many children were able to survive early childhood. So whatever you think of chivalry, understand from this moment forward that most acts of chivalrous, as I'm going to share with you in just a second, were done more for power, for control, sometimes for fashion or function, but they were not done out of kindness, love, or integrity on any level. So let's break down the history of many common chivalry things that we think are chivalrous and where they came from. And by the way, there's going to be a theme to all of these. And here's the theme. Big fucking uncomfortable dresses, lots of kids and pregnancy, and no fucking rights or money. That's going to be the theme here. Number one, I have to mention this first because it's a reminder that during a lot of history, up until the early 1900s even, women's dresses were nutso in the butso. So they had corsets. Many of them laced so hard that it led to health problems such as chronic indigestion, cardiac palpitations, breast ab abscesses, and displaced livers. And by the time they moved on to all of the layers or hoop skirts, that cost of beauty was terrible. Hoop skirts were horribly heavy, which led to damage to the top of the hips. And let's not forget the inability to sit down and just walking through the door to be a normal and functional human being. And the most terrifying story about hoop skirts or big dresses and its inconvenience leads to what happened in 1863 in Santiago, Chile, when a church was on fire. And women who were there tried to escape the flames, but their hoop skirts blocked the exit that led to 3,000 people's death. 3,000 people died because women's dresses were so big and so uncomfortable they couldn't get through the door. All right? So keeping that in mind as we move forward, giving up the seat. Now, who here thinks that a man giving up a seat for a woman or an elderly person is chivalrous. Well, that's actually from the Victoria era where giving up a seat comes from a man not wanting to have his head lower than a woman. They also stood above the women to be protective of their property because you were property, by the way, in the eyes of the law and usually in the eyes of your husband. Next, holding the door open. Who here is is constantly scanning for, well, are they holding the door open for me? Are they doing these kind and courteous things? Well, holding the door open for women comes because women's dresses were so large at the bottom that they couldn't reach the doorknobs. So women actually needed doors to be open for them. And then also, especially middle class or lower class women, were carrying children because there was no birth control. So you had some level of pregnancy or a baby or a child that needed to be held at all times. So the reason that the door was held open for you was because you legitimately, because of fashion and lifestyle, could not open it yourself. This is going to be a theme on a lot of these. St retrieving dropped items for a woman. That's, I think, a thing that if she drops something, somebody picks it up for her. Once again, you had a child in your hand or you had a dress that's so big and a corset so tight, you couldn't lean down to pick things up. Next, carry her bags or packages. Same problem. Big fucking dress, holding kids because there's no birth, birth control. So they had to carry her packages or bags because she was carrying the children. Picking up and dropping off in a vehicle. 
women couldn't afford vehicles because they were only paid something called pin money. So it was enough money to supplement their husband's or their father's income, but not enough to even actually live. You had to be picked up and dropped off in a vehicle by a man because you couldn't own one yourself or usually did not get paid enough to have the money. The only rule that I saw that actually had some level of chivalry was the sidewalk rule. And the sidewalk rule, as I mentioned, goes like this, that men should be on the outside in case of a splash from a buggy back then or horses and now like a car. But actually, here's what it comes from. The sewage and excrement and dead animals were so bad in historical America and Europe specifically that really men were doing that because otherwise women would be dragging their dresses and themselves in poop, pee, vomit, dead animals, and excrement. So this is the only thing that I think was maybe even slightly or remotely actually chivalrous. But once again, I think it probably came down a lot to property. It's a lot messier and harder for a woman's dress to get dirty and colder and wetter than it would be for a man because it was not even legal to to wear pants as a woman until 1923. You might be like, well, I would have been different. No, you wouldn't have. You would have been arrested. You would have absolutely been fucking arrested for not wearing dresses at the time. So I hope you're on the same page as me, that some of these ideas that we're pretty stuck on about what men should do and what it means are based on a whole bunch of sexist, awful bullshit that had a ton more to do with oppression and power and control than it has to do with if that person was a good person. And guys who are listening, because I know guys listen to this podcast, and I hope you fucking share this podcast with guys, because I'm going to talk specifically to men in just a second here. If you think that women should be doing certain things or that you should be doing this or they should be doing that, why? Is it actually getting you the relationship you're looking for? Is this building love between two people? Because what they've also proven is that people, both women and men, who believe in these deep ideas of chivalry are also really caught up on gender stereotypes, traditional relationships, and the basic idea that women cannot look after themselves. The thing about chivalry that we don't admit is that so many of these ideas and concepts were based after the idea that women were viewed as weak and men were strong. So in that sense, chivalry served a purpose because it reinforces the belief that men are the more capable gender and that women are in need of help and protection. Now, I found this great article on This Is Gendered, and they said, we see seemingly harmless and often well-intended behavior in what's called benevolent sexism. And it's sexist because it reproduces the oppression and marginalization of women by portraying them as weak and incapable whilst requiring that men always be strong and in control. Now, I think we all are seeing a backlash right now of men having too much power and control in our society and culture, not only publicly, not only in the government but also in relationships. Now, I want to speak to not only is that beyond unhelpful to women, that's beyond unhelpful to men. Some of the examples out there of benevolent sexism, as it's called, can be found in the workplace where women are often hired for their interpersonal skills. Because in other words, if they're hired for their feminine or soft skills rather than their training or their experience or their technical knowledge, then that really can lead to missed career opportunities. Next, chivalry and sexism more generally portray women as kind, precious, beautiful, fragile, nurturing, and a range of other quote-unquote feminine characteristics. 
And by the way, these beliefs, these, oh, women are kind and nurturing and fragile and we need to take care of them. They also are associated with victim blaming in cases of sexual abuse and domestic violence. And honestly, it denies men the capability to be gentle or compassionate, as well as the right to be vulnerable. Holding on to these ass backward ideas is oppressing women and oppressing men. Why do we have these hard and fast rules of chivalry and make them mean something? Why do I fucking see on every other Instagram, Facebook, TikTok post some other person telling women, next, move on, no to this, no to that, all of it? We somehow think that these small acts of chivalry, it's like a quick hack to decide whether this is a good person or potential partner. What we make it mean is that we make small gestures mean big things. But here is a reminder. Somebody opening the door for you doesn't mean that they're a good partner for you. Somebody who pulls out your seat doesn't mean that they are ready for a relationship or emotionally available. Somebody who picks you up at your apartment very well may be a rapist who then, when they drop you off, rapes you. Because that's fucking real and there's a percentage of first dates, particularly off of dating apps, that end in rape because we are not fucking protecting women. And that's what I think chivalry is. But I'm going to get there. I think that we think these small gestures mean love and intention. They mean interest. They mean integrity. They mean maybe a good upbringing or, or values. But the biggest issue I have about any of these rules, any of these ideas or acts of chivalry, is that none of us have agreed on these. One woman might have this idea of what this is what I want and I'm thinking about, but never communicating that with their date or their partner. If we are not agreeing this is the norm, if we are not agreeing that this is what everybody wants, or needs, then this is not working for us. If we are not looking at these ideas, if they still apply, if they make sense, if they're working for us in modern dating and relationships, then we're not dating to the best of our ability and we're going to keep missing matches. We're going to keep wasting our times with people who can fake good manners for a good couple of months until. You find out that they are not a good person. And I see women all over just particularly chalking people up to, oh, this is one of the good ones, green flag, this is one of the bad ones, red flag, without having any really critical thought into if that makes sense, if that actually lines up with what they're looking for in the relationship that they want. And can we as a society really count on these small things to make great relationships? Fuck no. I want to share one of my deep dives yesterday brought up a video from TikTok that was just actually in the last week. And this young guy, he's got quite the hair, by the way. Oh my God, did I sound 75 there? But yeah, I took the video, I transcribed it because I want to read what he said. Because whether or not you agree with it, and I don't even know if I fully agree with it, I think he makes a really, really good point. So I'm just going to read this to you, and I will put this in the show notes for you to watch yourself. He says, people love to assume that TikTok has drastically improved my dating life. It's actually ruined it. It's probably ruined yours, too, and I'll give you a perfectly good example about what I'm talking about. I was on a date a couple of weeks ago with this girl, and we were walking down the sidewalk. I'm walking on the side closer to the buildings. She's walking on the side closer to the road. And this starts a huge argument where she tells me that I'm not chivalrous because I'm not walking on the side closer to the road in the cars. And I'm thinking about this like reasonably, like that doesn't make a sense if a car loses control and comes careening towards the sidewalk. It doesn't matter if I'm going to be on the side closer to the cars. It's not like it's going to just hit me, bounce off me and get deflected in the other direction, leaving the girl unscathed. No, it's going to smash through both of us and we're both going to be gone. We'll be done. But anybody who's ever lived in a city knows, and he goes, and I live in LA, so this applies here, 
they're all kind of weird sketchballs that like to catcall women and harass them on the street. And they don't hang out on the side close to the road. They're sitting on stoops. They're leaning up against buildings. That's where they do all their weird, sketchy stuff from. So my thought is, okay, let me be protective of her and act as a barrier between here, her and all these weirdos. But she's not willing to hear that at all. Instead, she calls me a walking red flag. And of course, I mean, you could assume the date yeah, like fell apart from there, deteriorated. I did not text her back. I've not seen her since. I've not talked to her since and for good reason. But here's the problem. Just because anybody can get on this app and if they make a compelling enough case, if they talk about it with enough charisma, they can convince hundreds of thousands of people that doing things one way or another way is not chivalrous or it makes someone a red flag. Do not just write your partner off because they do one small little thing that TikTok told you to use your brain. Now, I don't think he's wrong. I don't know if I think he's 100% right, but I don't think he's wrong. I don't know if his cat calling harassment theory holds up, but I do think all of this warrants bigger conversations. And I think he's right to go, well, wait a second. You had an expectation that you never shared with me. You know, I don't actually have that same perspective of you. And she basically just said, I'm, I'm, I'm over this because of it. This is a way that we date in fear, not love. This is a way that we keep ourselves safe, but with walls, not boundaries. And by the way, we keep ourselves safe, not only from harm, but also from love. When we believe some of these old school ideas, I'm not going to tell you to not believe them, right? I'm not coming on here to say, think only the way that I think, although my shit is 15 years in and researched like crazy. But what I do want you to do is if you are really stuck on an idea, I want you to ask yourself, why? Why is this so important to me that this person does this thing? What am I making it mean about who they are or what they are to me? We need to ask ourselves better questions and we need to let men in on these conversations of what feels good and what doesn't. But if the only reason you have an idea is because you heard it in a two minute TikTok video, I think we can do better. I think that there's plenty of good concepts that can be taught online. I do it myself. But I think we also have to step back and critically think about, and here is a really, really simple and good question. If I'm dating like this, if I have this expectation of my potential partner, what am I making that mean? And is it getting me the relationship I want? But ultimately, so many of these small things like holding the door for you, which is just common human decency, I hold the door for people all the fucking time. People hold the door for me all the fucking time. That's a little bit of Midwestern nice, but I don't give a shit if somebody holds the door open for me or not. Who knows what's going through their mind? Who knows what they were told by somebody who didn't like it? The thing is, is that things are changing. Whether you like it or not, whether I like it or not, by the way, I really fucking like it. But they are changing. And to not put any kind of critical thought into what's working, what's not, what's helping, what's not, we have to raise the bar. If your bar is so low that somebody's paying for your date or opening the door for you equals a good person and a potential partner, huh? Is that it? That's all they have to do for you to go, oh, my God, this is the one. More importantly than all of that is these mindsets that particularly women are believing and encouraging men to do and believe are null and void if you have no rights or money. These ideas of what our grandparents maybe had or great grandparents or oh gosh, wasn't courting and wooing beautiful. No, you actually didn't get to pick who you wanted. They courted you for your family's land and some sheep and two sacks of grain. What you want, what you're thinking of never existed in history. There was never a time where women were quote unquote taken care of and pampered without 
there also being a time where they had no rights, had no control over their own body or anything. So to be pointing out to supposedly happier dating and relationships in history when women had zero rights, zero money is fucking ridiculous and so disempowering to everyone involved. You are using one criteria to make a dissent that is based on assumptions, traditions, and many times power and oppression. And if we're choosing somebody simply because they seem nice and are doing these things and ignoring all of the crappy behavior, that's a problem. After all of this, I'm clearly feeling passionately about it. Do I think chivalry should be dead? No, I actually don't. Fuck no, I don't. I absolutely think that we can look at modern society, culture, and dating and see there are ways that men can show up better for women in general. Absolutely and completely, but they're not about fucking opening doors or silly other little things that don't ultimately matter. What is chivalrous instead? I'm reinventing it right here. Noticing the real problem with the safety of women and being a fucking supporter and friend to women. Not because you want to sleep with them, not because you want them to like you, but because our world is unsafe due mostly to other men and single women have it even worse. Nearly one in five women and one in 71 men have been raped in their lifetime. I mean, that is a very large difference. Nearly one in 10 women in the U.S. has been raped by an intimate partner in her lifetime. These are real facts. This is real information. So do we need to, on some level, take care of women and particularly young women and children? Absolutely, we do. But it's not by opening a goddamn door for them. It's by noticing a very real problem in our society and being a friend and supporter. I'm not just reinventing dating. I'm reinventing chivalry. So here are ways that I think that we can now be more chivalrous in dating and relationships. And by the way, this is not just for men. Some of these are also for women. It's our job to help feel safe, secure, and supported by our partners. And that includes for men. Number one. Here is something that we don't talk anywhere near enough. Think about safe and easy dates for women. I know a lot of times we get caught up in the what's going to be romantic or depending where you live, like how long is it going to take me to drive there or how much is this going to cost? Stop thinking about that shit. Think about daytime. Think about public locations. No alcohol. 50% of women had their drinks or food spiked by a stranger. 50%. So if you want to go to the bar because you like a couple of drinks and it loosens you up and it makes you feel a little bit more charismatic, gives you the riz. I don't know. Am I saying that correct? I'm so lame. One of the kindest and most chivalrous things you can do is say, where would you like to meet up? And not women because they don't know or have suggestions, but because they're kindly thinking about what feels good for you and what is safe. Speak up for yourselves. This doesn't change when we ask people or expect them to read our minds. Think about safe and easy, especially first dates. You don't know them. They don't know you. And there is a chance due to the numbers I have just read that that person has been possibly raped, possibly roofied, possibly stalked, possibly attacked or assaulted. That is real. Number two, if someone sets a boundary, respect it and ask how you can make them feel safer on your dates. Don't take it personally if they want to go somewhere different or if they ask you to not pick them up. That's what I recommend women doing. Due to the fact of first date rapes, people should not know where you live until you know them well enough that you can trust them. So maybe you're offended when somebody says, no, I'll just meet you there. Maybe you're like, well, I'm just trying to be chivalrous. I'm sorry. I don't know why I did that voice, but I'm just trying to I'm just trying to do what my dad or my mom taught me. Well, your parents probably didn't teach you about how terrible women are treated in our society 
and how thoughtful behavior is making sure that they feel safe. You have no idea what has happened in her life, and she doesn't know what happened in yours. That's why we take the time to create safe and secure situations where we get to know each other in really healthy ways. Number three, respect timelines for dates, for intimacy, for vulnerability, and for sex. If you ask a question that she's not comfortable answering, respect that. Don't push, don't prod. Maybe you've asked something that is triggering to her. Maybe something bad happened in her life. Respect that. And then let her know if there is a time in the future that she wants to share it with you, that you are open to hearing about it. If somebody says they want to take it slow, emotionally, mentally, physically, respect that. They're trying to take care of themselves. They're not trying to withhold things from you. They are not trying to make you work for it. And my God, I hope they're not. But either way, both of you can slow down so that you can see if this is actually something. Because pregnancies from sex too quickly happen all the time. And then all of a sudden, you've taken a relationship that maybe had potential and thrown in a huge curveball that you now have to decide. How many relationships last from that in a healthy way? Not many. Number four, stand up for women. If you see a woman in public, and women, I am talking to you too. If you see a woman in public getting taken advantage of, drunk, possibly looking like she's roofied, if you suspect that something has been ingested, call 911, tell an employee, tell a bartender, whatever, but make sure that person is with a trusted friend or family member and stay with them until the emergency personnel arrive. 50% of women have been spiked by a drug in their drink or food. I am appalled at the amount of times that I have been out in the 90s and 2000s where I would see a woman in maybe a not great situation and not really do much about it. Just thinking, well, her friends have her or that's somebody else's problem. I'm appalled by that now because I have no idea what that woman was going through or if possibly she was in danger. But the least we can do is ask them. The least we can do is say, are you okay here? Are you feeling safe here? That's the least that we can do. Number five, standing up for what is right. If you hear jokes at women's expenses, dangerous conversation, jokes about rape, about harassment, about stalking, speak up. Say that's not okay. Silence is still part of the problem. Nothing changes if nothing changes here. Number six, do what you say you will do. If you say you're going to text tomorrow, text. If you say you're going to call in a couple days, call in a couple days. If you're like, let's do a date next week, follow up on that. It's not your job to do so, but due to the fact of women and attachment styles and things like that, you are going to get so much further if you continue to create a safe and secure space for them to learn how to trust you. It's part of a safety issue and inconsistency can sometimes trigger us and then we sabotage it. If you make sure that you are consistent and safe, and by the way, she should be too, right? I'm not saying that that shouldn't be. I'm not saying this is a one horse rodeo. This is for both people. It's a win-win. Number seven, wanting a partner, not a parent or maid who will do shit for you that you don't want to do is the new chivalry. If you're expecting that somebody's going to now be your mom and clean up after you and wash the dishes and cook and clean for you while they also are working a full-time job just like you without any discussion, nobody's going to feel good in that relationship. Not only is that oppressive and traditional and not working anymore, it actually doesn't get you a relationship where everybody feels good, where love can show up every day, which is the fucking goal here. Number eight, sharing what you are looking for up front. Defining that relationship and actually committing to it is the new chivalry. What do I mean by that? If you're only looking to date casually, you say that on the first date or even before. You just say, hey, I'm casually dating right now. I'm not looking for a relationship. Women fucking listen to them. Listen to them. If somebody says, I'm not interested in a relationship, that's not a challenge. That is not a Barney moment where you say challenge accepted 
and then you bend over backwards and give blowjobs for the next four months trying to win them over to love you. No. You go, hey, thank you for telling me. Good to know. I'm looking for a relationship if you are. So I'm going to probably move on to somebody else who is looking for the same thing as me. That's just smart. Number nine, being able to share your emotions kindly and honestly is the new chivalry. About the only emotion we've allowed for men is anger. Think about it. We don't even see a ton of happy men. I know this is a real thing because joy and happiness is vulnerable. And we don't really encourage men to be vulnerable, which is really a big part of the problem. One of my favorite parts of my relationship with my husband, Danny, is when he feels so comfortable to just get silly, to just laugh until he cries. I cherish those moments because that's not who he was in the beginning of our relationship. We had to build a level of trust and security to get there. But seeing him just laugh crazy unconditionally, that is more special and more important to me than almost any fucking active chivalry out there. So being able to express what you're feeling, express what you need, whether that be space, whether it be a boundary, whether it be a conversation, being able to do so kindly and honestly is absolutely new chivalry and is going to get you a much better relationship. If the only way you know how to express yourself is when you blow up, that's when you need to get to therapy. Number 10, asking about our day and listening. One of the leftover gender stereotypes is that women are talky, 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 and they're talking about nothing. No, they're just not talking about things that we've told men that they should value. This person's your partner and part of caring for them, part of lo loving them, part of respecting them is also listening to them and hearing them. All of these are for both people involved. Number 11, learning how your partner likes to be seen, heard, and loved is a new chivalry. And also women asking men how they want to be seen, heard, and loved. I've had, I've told this story a thousand times on my calls with my clients and even on like the former version of this podcast that one of the first things I did in our relationship when we decided to be monogamous was ask Danny to reach out every day. I have an extremely anxious attachment style. I tend to sabotage the unknown. And it was the basic thing that I needed from him for me to feel safe and secure enough to do this relationship. And at the end of that conversation, I said to him, and if there's something that you need or that I can do for you, let me know. And I will never forget that Danny's eyes opened up like a deer in headlights and goes, no one's ever asked me what I've needed. Nobody's ever asked me what I need to feel loved or to, to feel good. It's like, I'll have to think about it because I legitimately don't know. I don't think that this is a failing on his part at that point, because now I know exactly what he needs, because that's what a relationship is, to feel loved and he knows exactly what I need. But more importantly, that we don't actually even ask men about their needs, their emotional needs, not just sexual. That seems to be what we talk about are the physical needs. But what are the emotional needs? And then finally, number 12 for all of us is getting therapy and healing and working on our stuff if any of these feel really, really hard. If we find ourselves choosing people that are unhealthy and unhelpful, if we find ourselves continuing to be in situations that aren't good, if we continue to notice that we're not treating the people in our lives as well as we want to, there are professionals who can help with that. That's not even me. I'm that next step. I'm like, when you want to start dating how to do it really smartly, strategically, and personally for you. 
But this whole world, especially dating and relationships, get better when we can all heal a little bit. We have to stop getting stuck on who's opening the doors or where they walk. And we need to start looking at actual qualities that exist in an emotionally and physically available partner. That is for all of us to do. Those rules of chivalry are for all of us because I see women not protecting women. We are all kind of part of the problem. And that includes myself. I am educating and teaching myself and then coming over here and trying to educate and teach you so we can all start having bigger and better conversations around this. So that we can stop getting caught up about pushing people away or calling somebody a walking red flag because they walked on a part of the sidewalk that maybe you know about, but they don't. Like, it's ridiculous. And honestly, it's unhelpful. All right, guys. I hope this podcast blew your mind a little bit that even if this is the first podcast you heard from me, you realize there is so much that you can do and learn before we date or before we get into relationships that can make this easier. Love is not broken. Dating isn't even really broken. We just don't do it very well. And it's vulnerable and it can feel scary putting ourselves out there. But I will say it once and I'll say it again. All of this gets a shit ton easier when we know who we are, we know what we need, and we know how to date to spot it in real life. These are information, mindsets, and skills you can build at any age. That's exactly what I teach. And it makes this whole dating, love, and relationship thing feel less intimidating, less hard, because you know how to take care of yourself. You know what you're looking for, and you can create a relationship where love is felt by both people every single day, which is the whole point. Because life is hard, and it kind of sucks, and it gets better when you have somebody to do it with. I don't really give a shit if that's a relationship, romantic, or just a friendship. But you will still need to have most of these skills to be in friendship and community with people, whether it's romantic or not. All right, guys, that's it for this week. What did you learn? If you liked this, if you loved it, please make sure you subscribe. Come check out reinventingdating.com. And one huge favor, please share this with the other singles that you know, so we can all reinvent dating together. Because when we know what love is, when we know our mindsets, when we understand how we work, we understand the skills, we can get in better relationships, period. All right, guys, I will see you next week. Next week, I am coming in hot talking about... Next week, I am coming in hot talking about who should pay specifically for the first date. And then how to navigate that also moving forward. It's going to be a good one. Until then, my sugar pantses, meet love halfway. <laughs>